All right, so we have Low Level Learning joining us. Hey, Low Level Learning, what do you do? I am a security researcher. So people like Prime, who are much smarter than me, he's over here, not over there. Uh, he writes code. My job is actually to look at code and find bugs in code. And uh, a pattern that I've recognized and that you've probably heard a lot about is that 70%, if not more, of all exploits used to hack people are because of memory corruption bugs. The big perpetrator there is the C language. And so according to this article, DARPA wants to turn all C into Rust. So we'll see uh, how that plays out. I'm, I'm interested into, <laughs> in their approach. I, I'm currently doubting because I've only heard a little bit, which, of course, the little bit I've heard is AI, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right, what right. I've heard. So I'm just like, ain't, ain't no way. Is this real? Yeah, and so DARPA actually hosted the uh, AICC at DEF CON this past year, which basically was— Yeah, they put was, $14 million for seven teams. Mm-hmm. They f funded a lot of people to basically, like, given a code base using only LLMs, can you find bugs and patch them in software? It's a cool idea. Uh, I personally think it's a little overambitious, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what the article has to say. Did you ever, like, before we go on, did you ever yeah. uh, read the article by Daniel Lat Latmere? Lemire? Lemire, no, he did, uh, no. the I in LLM stands for intelligence. Oh, my God. No, that sounds great, though. Yeah, it's a very, very good article. I don't know why. It just, apparently, I typed it in, and it just moved it over here into my history. Here, how about you just, how about you just let me see it instead? That was kind yeah. of a strange move. Weird. Just thank you for just moving it into my history. But he does an entire thing about these bug bounties because in Curl, they started getting all these reports, and the reports were absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, let's. Uh, one of them was, like, you should have saw the conversation. Uh, I don't see the conversation on it, but it, it went something like this. Oh, you're doing a stir length check, and stir, uh, uh, let's see, or no, you're using stir copy instead of stir end copy in a place that's going to cause a buffer overflow. Mm -hmm. And right above that line, directly above it, it checks the length. Right. And returns. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's then just, it like, goes on, and the, and he starts answering questions, and then it just the person started responding with code that didn't exist, and it was clearly just an LLM designed to find stuff and then report bugs and then to respond to things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, dude, it's an interesting problem. I mean, the problem right now with AI in particular is that like people tend to forget that AI isn't just like this bot that is all knowing. It's just a language model that is trained on human data, and humans suck at basically everything. Um, yeah. so as a result, like you can go into ch like ChatGPT right now and like, hey, generate me code for an HTTP server, and it will literally produce a, a snippet of code with like four or five memory corruption bugs. It's it's wild. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, so I have this I have this running theory that I have, which goes something like this. I think you'll appreciate it. Is that someone asked, are security jobs in risk with AIs in the future? And this is my general take: is that LLMs are trained on people, right? Mm -hmm. This is how they get good. They take people data. People for the last, really for the last about 14 years have been using GitHub to post all of their code. Mm -hmm. And this is where a lot of these bots are being trained on, on any of these public suppositories of information, if you will. Yes. For those last 14 years, people have been terrible at writing code that's secure. Mm-hmm. LLMs produce that code again. <laughs> yep, and so, and we so have it's this just like wonderful cycle of just like <laughs> it, the initiativeification intensifies, right? Like, and this is now going to set the foundation of like the future of code, which is amazing. Yeah, um, it's just like college, bad goes in, bad comes out. It's not that LLMs are to blame; it's that people were never good at writing secure code. I'm not good at writing secure code. I don't think anyone's good on the out on the outset. I think you have to go through a quite a bit of testing before you can actually write really good secure code I agree. or you're writing something that's absurdly simple. So therefore this just magnifies our stupidity mm -hmm. as long as our ability to produce simple problems. No, I agree. I mean, dude, I've been coding in C for over 10 years and I still find myself like, Oh, I forgot to check this variable. And now like, if you do this, this happens. Right. Um, when I was in, in college, actually, we played in the CTF where it was, they're trying to teach you how to do fuzzing. Right. And so they gave you a thousand snippets of code and where they got the code from was actually just they searched for pro projects in GitHub that use string operations. It was like, okay, cool. Take any snippet of GitHub code. If it's a string operation, use that as a sample. And so they compiled all of them for you. And your the whole idea was automate as fast as possible. Can you find a crashing state in, the, in these pieces of code? And not shockingly, like over half of them, you could find like exploitable vulnerabilities. in. so it's just like, wow. If we're training LMs on that, man, it's not a, not a great thing, you know? Yeah. All right. Hey, Bisco did say, wow, an actual smart person on this stream finally. I can't believe he just insulted Ginger Bill, who was smart. here yesterday, who created I was say, Odin. Yeah, you had the Odin creator on. That's, yeah, that's, Odin creator. Wow. Smart, dude. Jeez. Jeez, I and didn't K realize Casey that. Casey Moratori. He was here, too. Yeah, yeah. Casey Moratori. 
Chris Latner, I gosh, mm -hmm. I pff, man, Beast Kill must think really highly of you or really low of those other people. That's pretty mean of him, I'd say. Both are questionable <laughs> opinions. Let's just go with that. Both are questionable. Okay, I'm gonna read it and then we'll kind of go. You know, we'll read for a moment. If you have something to say, you can pause me or mm -hmm. I'll pause and I'll start talking. Sorry. One of the two. The ongoing efforts to limit and prevent software vulnerabilities has a powerful companion champion in this Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which has launched an ambitious effort to migrate C language applications to Rust for memory safety reasons. I think we can all agree that, generally speaking, probably a good idea to use more safe languages than C in the government so you don't get hacked. Yeah, and I think like the, what's funny is you will probably get a shockingly negative response in the video just from this part alone. People for some reason hate Rust, and I still have not figured out why. I think it's the political aspects of the foundation, maybe. But in general, like transitioning code towards a memory safe language is a good thing. Like we are going to create a safer society if we do that. The question is just the the ethics and, and the practices of how we do that. But overall. Totally on board with this. Uh, DARPA for a long time has been doing programs that like try to make the world a safer place, right? One of them uh, back like I think 10 years ago at this point was the, the Cyber Grand Challenge. Can we automate the analysis of code through not AI, but through uh, it's called formal analysis, right? Program analysis where you essentially track the data and the states and the ways that the, the data can mutate as it takes different branches in the code and are any of those branches exceeding what the program can, can track via like stir copies and stuff. So stuff like that has been going on for a long time. Uh, they haven't taken on the memory safety thing, so I'm, I'm interested to see where they go with this. All right. Well, I, I believe I can actually answer the reason why people dislike Rust. Sure. And I think you know the reason inherently, and it's the same reason why you also have this sickening feeling in your stomach when you're doing Rust in certain situations, is that Rust in itself is actually really, really simple. And what I mean by that is that the borrow checker, it's really not a hard concept. It'll take you like a moment. If you just read for a second and read like the Rust book for the first page, you'll go, oh, oh, okay, I get it. It's move semantics, and they mean this versus that. Okay, I got that. That's not too hard. Yep. But then the moment you graduate into anything else that, that requires lifetimes and async, it's yep. just all of a sudden life just really sucks. And if you want to use uh, traits – Traits also just are not fun when you mix all these things together. Right. Like everything, when you want to actually build a real program that you would say in Go in just a couple lines, it becomes this really advanced battle of just making syntax everywhere. Mm -hmm. no, and I it's agree. very, very, very difficult. And so been... Rust, or early Rust, early game Rust, really fun, right? Yeah. When you're leveling out, really, really fun. Then you realize it, it feels like a pay-to-win Genshin Impact game because right. <laughs> the yeah. difficulty goes through the roof and you're like, this is just not fun. And yeah. I do think Zig could be a better alternative because it mm -hmm. has the, the things you want. It has nullable pointers, meaning, hey, this pointer could be null. And the other one is error unions. I think if you just add that, you could eliminate an entire class of these memory problems. Right. I think the reason why I lean at least, okay, so in terms of programming in general, I agree with you, I lean towards Zig. I think from, from a, a code safety perspective, I do lean closer to, to Rust because Rust does come off as more of like, not that it's mathematically proven to be safer, but like the compiler is not going to let you do things that are exploitable from a memory corruption standpoint. Whereas like Zig, you can literally create a, a, you know, a structure on the stack Call that in, in a function, return that structure on the stack, and now you've given away a pointer to where the data could show up in another stack frame somewhere else. You know what I mean? You can't, yeah. you can't do that in Rust. So it's like, I think Zig is an easier language. I don't think it has all of the memory safety features that we need from like a true uh, a safe language, you know? You can leak a pointer from the stack and have it right. get clobbered, and then you just have no idea what happened. Right. Yeah. That's very fair. Okay. Uh, DARPA notes that memory safety vulnerabilities are the most prevalent type of disclosed software vulnerability that can occur with programming languages like C that allow programmers to manipulate memory directly, making it easy to accidentally introduce errors in their program that would enable a seemingly routine operation to corrupt the, sa the state of memory. A memory safety issues can arise when a programming language exhibits an undefined behavior, according to the post on DARPA's website. Yeah. Nothing groundbreaking yeah. there. I mean, that's like I said before, 70%, if not more, of, of hacks that have happened have been because like, oops, I, I wrote outside of the bounds of my C buffer. Now what? You know what I mean? And, and then hackers yeah. take advantage of that and do evil stuff. So, And they do wild stuff. We saw the SSH vulnerability. We saw uh, I, apparently the IPv6 is also the same thing where mm -hmm. it gets it into a certain state that can read memory that can allow it to overwrite return addresses the, or whatever the, it was. The and then, TCP uh, bug in, in, um, in Windows came out. Yeah, yeah, the the yeah the not TCP. It's uh, IPv6. 
Yeah, so no one knows. I mean, the people that reported it obviously do. No one knows what the actual root cause is, but it, it said it's a, it's an integer underflow. What it likely is is that the way that it's parsing some field in the IPv6 spec, you can cause a counter to wrap around and then copy more memory than you have room for, right? And then from there, you're getting not only code execution on Windows, code execution in Windows on off in the kernel. So not a great place to be. And again, if they <laughs> had used memory safe language, if that's even possible in the Windows kernel, then we would have uh, not had this issue. So okay, yeah, I mean that is fair, potentially. Probably, probably fair, probably fair. Yeah. After more than two decades of grappling with memory safety issues in C and C++, the software engineering community has reached a consensus. Relying on a relying on bug finding tools is not enough, and that's probably fair. Stat, static analysis and uh, ASAN will get you pretty dang far, mm -hmm. but you can still have these bugs, which I don't think ASAN is ever going to catch. Yeah, I mean, we saw that with the uh, the lib web p bug, right? Like they had the the Huffman encoding table that if you if you got the encoding table to this very specific state where like a fuzzer was mathematically never going to find it, oopsie daisy, I made a Huffman t table that's too big, and you get a buffer overflow, right? Um, so I think that's instead of by the way. instead of having to reverse engineer the bugs out of code, we should just forward engineer safety into the code, which you know yeah. is, is the whole goal here. And by the way, for those that think I'm a Rust hater, I'm not a Rust hater. I just recognize that you should use Rust when you actually need to use it. So if I was going to write a network stack that was going to be used by the government, I would probably choose Rust mm -hmm. because it is simply the. I just don't want to screw it up. Like I don't want that kind of bug to show up where I actually have a Huffman table that's too long. Right. Yeah. Uh, however, the shift toward the use of Rust and recent breakthroughs in machine learning techniques like large language models have created an environment that may lend itself to a new class of solutions DARPA pr proposes. So on its face, what do you think is the successful likelihood of this type of research? I, okay, so like, first of all, from a personal standpoint, I lean pessimist. I am not a very <laughs> positive person. Um, I don't think we know a lot about LLMs. I think it is still very much in the, the startup phase, just globally, right? Um, and I think because of that, we have a traditional case of like the government trying to get an early start on something or fix a problem that they see, but not fundamentally understanding it. Um, you can look at the, the TikTok thing, right? Where like they brought on the TikTok CEO from Singapore and they're like, does TikTok use the Wi-Fi? And it's like, brother, like, yes, but that's not what you <laughs> meant to ask. And it's like, I, again, I think that My is a solution Christ. here. I just don't think we're there yet. I think going back, instead of using LLMs, I think there is a solution in the world of like, you know, program analysis using things like, uh, you know, tracking the state of the program in a, in a formal analysis way, not in an AI way. But I feel like I thought we already had a program that did this. I thought CGC already did this back in the day. So I'm curious kind of how that research plays into this. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm not sure how I feel about them conflating formal analysis, memory safety with AI. They just they just feel like separate things to me. But again, I'm not an AI guy. So, All right. Well, one thing I think is really interesting that you pointed out, and I just happened to accidentally have this up. Mm -hmm. I have an SEC filing of Google up right now. Okay. Now, SEC filing is done with something called XBRL. And XBRL is HTML 3.1. The government at one point said, we need to be hip with these kids, and we need to start using the latest technologies. And at that point, it was HTML 3.1, and yeah. they adopted their standard to prevent Enron from ever happening again, and it was called XBRL. Now, fast forward years later, they have not updated the spec once. So I always have this whole problem where whenever these technologies get incorporated at an early cycle, they don't ever actually go forward and they get stuck in this kind of like proposal process of not ever being updated. And then it just turns into trash. Yeah, right. Even if the, maybe the idea could be good. And I even have some uh, insider knowledge that some, some big wows may be coming in recent, fu in, in recent future for the, uh, some of the LLMs. Mm -hmm. And even that, I'm not convinced that that one is going to be even as good to be able to do these things. So I'm also a, pessimist, a pessimistic in uh, models mm -hmm. generally. Yeah, just because it, I mean, I I did a little bit of my master's in AI before okay. Netflix hired me away and took me away, and it, it's a lot of it is just statistics, right? It's just yeah. Full, full disclosure, I don't know anything formally about AI. All I know is that I've used AI, and like from a, a programming perspective and security perspective, I haven't seen it do anything that's like super impressive. That being said, I'm using like the OpenAI ChatGPT model or whatever, so I'm not using like yeah. a, a model trained on code. So you know, I could be wrong, but just personally, yeah. I'm not a, not a huge fan. Rust forces the programmer to get things right, O'Wallach uh, said in a statement. It can feel constraining to deal with all the rules it forces, but when you acclimate to them, 
the rules give you freedom. They're like guardrails. Once you realize they are there to protect you, you'll become free to focus on more important things. This is most certainly true for memory, but it is most certainly not true for potential things that can destroy your company. And what I mean by that is that, uh, again, uh, I wrote a bug once that could take down all of Netflix with a single three-line bash script that Mm -hmm. Rust would never have protected me from. And so it's like, so these things do exist. Just because you have, just because you're using Rust does not mean you cannot accidentally create a horrifying bug. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. Like, Rust is not a bug-free language. Like, you can still leak memory. You can still crash the program. But I think what it does guarantee you is that bugs that you introduce will... I don't even know if all the time, but most of the time not be exploitable. We talked about um, the CrowdStrike incident, for example, right? Like, if it was written in Rust, would that have solved the problem? And I think the answer is it would have still crashed the kernel, right? Like, yeah. if, if that bug were somehow remotely exploitable by a hacker in C, it would no longer be exploitable by a hacker in Rust, but it still would have created the DOS condition. Because like you were saying, if they used a vector to access that array, and then they used, like, hard brackets 42, like, it's still going to crash the freaking the, the, the yeah. kernel, right? Yeah, as so, far as we can tell for the CrowdStrike, for those that don't know, is that they had a matcher that would produce an array of 21 elements, and then they changed the regex matcher from a wildcard match at the end to a concrete match, which made the array come in under some circumstances as length 20, which means they had literally a script that accessed all 21 elements with zero length checking. And so therefore, even in Rust, that would have gone kaboom. Like you can't, you just can't do that in any language, it turns out. <laughs> right, it's not shocking. You shouldn't access, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So Rust also would have failed if he would have just bracketed that. All right. All right. So indeed, memory-safe languages such as Rust really protect us from ourselves, namely bad or lazy software development that may work just fine but contains the potential for ruin if run or attacked in the right way, said Brad Shimon, analyst at Omida. Okay, fair. Uh, DARPA alone can fix it. Despite the ambitious scope of the project, Rust experts see the value in DARPA taking on the effort above others. It is a formidable task, and especially, let's see, and that's precisely why the agency like DARPA should support it. Tim McInera, uh, founder of Accelerant and author of Rust in Action, told Newstack. However, I'm quite skeptical that the stated aims in the abstract are even possible. Right. How can one preserve the semantics of the original code without preserving its bugs? He asked. Still, the worst case is that the software industry gains more information about how to translate old code into memory-safe code alternatives. The best case is that we gain a tool that can protect critical infrastructure against digital sabotage. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the the, the vibe that I get to when I read the paper. I'm like, this is a cool idea. I think we should probably look into how you would do this, but I'm not even sure that you could possibly do it, right? Like, how do you... How do you take like like he's saying right? How do you take the code and then like for the C example like lift the the compiled C or even like the, the C in its in its source code form to an IR and then transmute the IR to like a Rust IR and then you know convert that into Rust without preserving the functionality that created the bug in the first place. So I don't it's a it's a weird idea and obviously this is why it's a research thing. Um, but it it is a a lofty goal for sure. Yeah, I would assume it'd be easier to not do the IR but actually translate the code itself. Because at least, you know, with the ones that are dangerous, such as stir copy, you could have some sort of conditions that may be unreachable, the, the program, some way to signal to yourself in debug mode that you've just goofed up. Yeah. But it seems, it does seem impossible. And I think he, he makes a perfect point, which is that C does things in which Rust can't do, mm-hmm. like intentionally can't do. So yeah. how can you, how can you translate that? Yeah, I mean, take take any um, any embedded application, for example, right? Like the whole point of embedded applications is you have global mutability where some of the pointers are just the I.O. interface, right, to like right yep. onto the serial console. But that is the antithesis of Rust. Like in Rust, you cannot have global mutability. So how would you translate an embedded code base to to Rust? I don't think you can, like semantically. But lazy maybe, static, lazy static one cell or whatever it is. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I mean, I... I've done it in an embassy um, using like an async framework in Rust, but like that's going from a like completely new code base up. Like translating somebody's like ar- like architected ten years ago STM32 code into Rust would take me years to do. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, moreover, uh, some are concerned about whether it's even a good idea to move an entire code base from C to Rust unless that code base is actively evolving or in use with high risk environment which is surely a case with DARPA. 
Let's see. For the average enterprise, however, refactoring at this scale is liable to incur risk for a couple reasons. Really? <laughs> that's that's crazy. I can't believe that there's risk in refactoring a giant C code base into Rust. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious, like, what the scope of this is. Is like, is DARPA just trying to like rewrite like codes within the DoD that that use C, or are they like, hey, Linux kernel, like, here's a program, just please run it, and now the Linux kernel is all in Rust. Like, good luck. <laughs> that, yeah. that sounds more a little more terrifying. I know you got a lot of linked lists out there, but goodbye. Yeah, we don't need uh, those anymore. We're just gonna use a recursive box. Okay, good good luck. <laughs> There's a good reason the Linux kernel development team has taken its time incorporating just a tiny bit of Rust into the predominantly C code base, he said. First, unless the company has solid foundation in Rust, such a move would be like driving a car blindfolded, just asking for an issue to surface unexpectedly. Second, even the even though Gen AI can certainly transcribe snippets from one language into another, that transcription will lack contextual awareness of the entire code base. Mm-hmm. Yep, I think we've talked about all those things. Yeah, Proposal expected. Wallach also is hoping for proposals that include novel combinations of software analysis, such as static and dynamic analysis, and large language models. The DARPA program will host public competitions throughout the effort to test the capabilities of LLM-powered solutions. So yep. is that what DEF CON was? Was yeah. just them trying to host more and more of this? So that, that's, what, that's to- what DARPA has done in the past. For the last like 10 or so years, they've effectively funded CTFs that are to test and showcase the result of, of their projects, right? So they had CGC back in the day, like 10 years ago, and then uh, we had AICC, A- AIXCC, whatever, this year. Um, so I'm sure that like the, the tractor program will be like the CTF for DEF CON in the next couple of years, for sure, which is cool. I want to see where this goes. You know, I'm not like pessimistic about the program. I'm just very skeptical of, of the implementation. You know, yeah, it's actually it's a super brilliant idea Mm -hmm. to go to the largest convention of the people that are likely the ones you want to hire. Put 14 million dollars down on the line and say you're going to hire seven teams with 14 million dollars. Here's the challenge. Go like, (laughs) yeah, see you next year. (laughs) Like, let me know what you think. It's quite it's 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 a very, very smart way to hire by accident. Mm-hmm. 100%. I mean, that not that how Thor got his job with the DOE? Like, he won two DEF CON black badges, and the Dark Department of Energy is like, hey, you, you want a job? <laughs> like, what are you doing over there? And that's that's how he got hired for the government. That's pretty cool. <laughs> hey there, brother. You got you got a lot of experience, and I like those black badges. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember the exact reason, but I think it's right along. I, it's some level of black badging and all that. Right, right. All right, DARPA will sp- uh, let's see. DARPA will sponsor a Proposers Day on August 26th, with you can attend in person or virtually. Participants must must register by August 19th. Details in registration are available here at sam.gov. Yeah, All right, so I, I do want to say real quick, if anyone in chat or anyone watching this video like honestly thinks they have a way that they could solve this, you can go to this event in Arlington. You just got to submit your paperwork by in the next three days or so, or whenever this video comes out. Um, but yeah, you can go to this event. You can you can like. Give a presentation on why, how you think that your solution is the best and maybe win some government money to, to, to do this. So it, if you think you got an answer, go try out. Yeah, it is true. You could potentially get a lot of money, too, even if you're only close close enough. Right. DARPA, DARPA do, has been known to toss out some dollars to get, get the right stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Relying on LLMs. You can go to any of the LLM websites, start chatting with one of the AI chatbots, and you'll – let's see. And all you need to say is here's some C code. Please translate it to safe idiomatic Rust code. Cut and paste something that comes out, and it's often very good, but not always, said Wallach, uh, or said Wallach said in a statement. That's weird. Uh, the research challenge is to dramatically improve the automated translation from C to Rust, particularly for program constructs with the most relevance. Okay. I mean, I am curious if this can actually work out, because once you get into that, you got the whole lifetime problem. Yeah. yeah lifetimes yeah, I'm are not very sure interesting because they leak it's... through everywhere. I'm not sure if I agree that it's good all the time. Like, I've definitely tried to do, like, even just, like, coding in C, and they give me some garbage. So I would love to see an example of, like, translating C to Rust in, in like, open AI AI model. That'd be kind of cool. But I have not had good success with AI coding in general. I think this is where all the LLM Andes will jump in and be like, "Mm, let's Claude Sonnet. Um, Right, right, right. That's apparently the best one. The progress of LLMs in the last year has been substantial, and their ability to formulate and translate human intelligence has risen to academic and professional translation levels, said Holger Mueller, an analyst at Constellation Research. Not surprisingly, it is DARPA constructing an LLM that transfers C code into Rust, thus eliminating the dreaded memory issue that often uh, often have been created in C, he told Newstack. Extra benefits of modern programming languages will will be having a larger, unusually growing developer base and better documentation of code. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. I'm just going to keep reading for a little bit because I think yep. we'll, we'll probably just agree with these statements. Further, yeah. the it's best good to repeat itself too. Like, yeah, we're good. Yeah. Further, even the best Gen AI models are not at this time generating code at the same level you'd get from an accomplished programmer. Still, if motivated, a company interested in moving to Rust could fine-tune a suitable LLM using the existing C code base and state-of-the-art Rust code, Shimon said. Then, if a model has sufficiently large enough context window, that company might see some usable results. But I, I will say the, the, the counter to this exact statement is, let's say you are a company. Let's say you do have a large code base. Let's say you have a sufficient amount of money to be able to do this research, and you were able to successfully translate a working version of your program into Rust. Mm -hmm. You then have to convince and hire people to come and work for your AI-translated code base. Right. Which, yeah, I mean, has to be, which has to be crazy. Yeah. This is like the fundamental issue, I think, with security in a capitalist society, whatever the fuck you want to call it, right? Like the companies need to be incentivized by some method other than profit to do this kind of stuff, because like it is not profitable to be safe. It is profitable to churn out code that works, you know what I mean? And works is kind of yeah. in air quotes. So, yeah, like, you know, what is going to push a company to, to hire on the new, you know, Gen Z, I learned Rust in college workforce and then work on an AI generated code base? I don't know how that's going to play out like corporate. <laughs> I, I mean, even just like, just socially, like, will a bunch of the Rust developers want to work at a place that did generate this just crap heap of code? Because you right. know it's not going to be great. Right. 100%. It's going to get real weird after a while. And you're just going to be like, I don't want to. Why, why do they do it? I, I'm so confused at what's happening. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be full of, even if they're safe, like just hallucinations and misnamings and stuff. It's just, just, it's just how, it's how AI has worked. I've never seen it not do weird shit on, on regular prompts. Yeah, and I know people are saying it's profitable to be unsafe, but to be completely fair, CrowdStrike stock uh, would beg to, some of the differ at least uh, that it's not always well, cause profitable. They got, caught. they got caught on a public forum. It's not common for like like a router, right? Like a, a piece of shit, like you know, twenty dollar Soho router. There are bugs in those things all the time. But has TP Link ever seen a, a stock drop from that? No, because no one cares. The only reason we cared about this is because Nancy and her family didn't get to go to the Bahamas. They, you know, they missed their flight. So it's a little different. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that is the cost of unsafe code is that eventually you can, even, even these crappy uh, routers, they work because they're so cheap that people will buy them. Sure. No, you're right. But at some point, you know, if, if, if someone makes a cheap working router, if that's not shitty, then guess what? The, you know, the shitty breaking one will, in fact, go away. I just don't know if people actually see that. Like, I don't know if, if Nancy and her family would buy the $80 router if it's safer than the $20 router. I think they just see the, it, it does the same things. They, but they all claim they have military-grade encryption because they do AAS somewhere in the, in the code base, right? So it's like, okay, they're all safe, and that one's 20 bucks. so there you go. I don't know, man. It's interesting. Okay, okay, I, I buy it. Maybe Nancy isn't the target audience for these things. All right, uh, but even then... Uh, just uh, that's just code generation he noted what about unit regressions and or regression and other form of testing that in and of itself would require an extensive expertise both in testing and in rust to end up with a code base that's at least as safe as the original and testable yeah testable i never even thought about yeah. to actually make the code testable in other words can it be done but it will not be easy and it will prove costly in resources i'm not even sure if it can be done i'm not i don't buy this statement to begin with that it actually can be done yeah, that's a, that's a stretch to claim that it can be done. Like, I think part of the research should be like, is this even like mathematically or like scientifically feasible? You know what I mean? I don't, I don't yeah. even know if we're there yet. And no, I wasn't talking about Nancy Pelosi chat. I just that's like the first <laughs> female soccer mom name that came to my head. I didn't mean the it's politician. It's too late. We're uh, talking so, no, about I, Pelosi. I see Pelosi in the chat. I'm like, God damn it. It's Political late. stream. What do you think of her stock picks? Let's I go. Know. Oh, my God. Um interesting i don't <laughs> think i don't think that congress people shouldn't be able to stock trade because that would de-incentivize citizen participation in the government however comma it is weird that they have records better than warren buffett so what's the right answer i don't know i have no idea yes. okay i'm on your team uh the, i don't know if you've seen the research but uh they they broke it down by party republicans mm -hmm. are turns out are worse uh, traders than democrats republicans really? are only 1.3 x their money every year statistically better than the s p by 4x wow okay. and democrats are at 1.7 or 1.8 so they're like even better statistically i think which that's all funny. nancy pelosi because she's like 15x every year yeah well which is funny because the republicans are the ones that are always like oh they're in bed with big oil they're the rich ones and it's like <laughs> well the numbers uh hello like, <laughs> hello everybody's making money this is kind of right. crazy what's right. happening a little weird a little yeah. weird everybody um 
No, okay, since we're here, I personally think that if you join Congress, you should get a tax-funded 401k that's building, and you have no – it's a hands-off 401k. You just simply cannot trade uh, stock while you're there. Just like me when I was sure. at my company, I could not trade stock because I could not trade stock in my company because I knew things about it. That's a pretty normal – it's a pretty normal thing because if you're yeah. about to d- announce you're going to make uh, $20 link routers that are kind of shitty illegal in the United States, it would be a really great dime to right. go buy some puts on that company that you're right. just about to destroy in a single law or yeah, even okay. announcing the law, right? That's yeah, all you have so to maybe, do is you don't even have to follow through. You just have to announce it. Maybe like just a 401k that's managed by an independent organization so that like there's no government influence. But like the the, the thing is you still have to be incentivized to work in government. If you are de-incentivized by working in government, then like I think we'll just have more and more shitty people show up. But yeah, I, I agree with you. If you have a well-proven 401k that it you know invests in these funds that you have no control yep. over, then 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say the spy. You have to make the entire stock market go up and then you get more money. Yeah, sure. Okay. Because if the whole yeah. stock market doesn't go up, you're not making money. The end. Right. Look at this. We just like proved it. everything. There you go. We're good to easy go. Easy Put it into law right now. Sign it. I'll sign it. Let's do it. All right. Uh, someone's asking, what is a 401k? 401k references a specific tax code. I forgot what it is, but it's like section 401 paragraph K. It is uh, some sort of a uh, law around how a investment account can be created by individual citizens and how the taxes work and all that on it. That's what yeah. 401k is. So that's why there's also an IRA. There's actually uh, there's actually a few different type of K investments that you can do. Anyways, okay, I'm glad we're on the same page. Same page. All right. Oh, yeah. First, writing safe rust requires discipline, uh, use of pointers that is not typically reflected in C, he told the new stack. Second, once safe rust has been generated, there is a validation question. How can you be sure that your rust is functionally equivalent to your C? We've mm-hmm. already talked about that and absolutely agree. Eleo added that AdaCore is watching Tractor with interest for potential future solutions. While the work of moving critical code from C to Rust does seem daunting, we have already made a lot of progress, said Josh A.S., Executive Director of Internet Security Research Group, told the new stack. Uh, Today, there are memory-safe and high-performance options for TLS, NTP, pseudo-DNS, and AV1 decoding. Oh, that's crazy they got AV1 decoding. As, 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 explained, We've experimented with transition tools to help develop some of, uh, some of those tools, and we're glad to see DARPA invest in making that more uh, that a more robust option. Sorry, my reading's going down. Reading's reading's getting hurt. Uh, as memory safe, I know. Just give me okay, quickly. Okay, there we go. Hold on, let me just go like this. Let me just. Okay, we're green. We're so bad. Oh, yeah, All right, maybe. I'm back in. I'm back in. I'm back in. I'm locked in. As memory safe software becomes more readily available, we'd like to start seeing it deployed on more widely, seeing it deployed more widely in production. Shit, that green didn't even help me. <laughs> All right. Huh, interesting. You know, isn't one of the hard parts about Rust uh, the interaction point between C and Rust? Isn't that like a whole danger zone in of itself? Right, because, I mean, people argue like, oh, unsafe Rust is bad, and that kind of like defeats the purpose of the language. Well, that, first of all, that's not necessarily true, right? Like unsafe Rust still does borrow checking. It still does array access checks. It just it gets rid of some of the guarantees that the language gives you. That being said, to do C interop, you have to create what's called an FFI, a foreign function interface. And the FFIs are unsafe by default because like the borrow checker and the compiler can't go into that code base to see what's happening. So it's an assumed unsafe boundary. So if you want to use Rust code to interop with C, it's difficult, right? It's not uh, a straightforward process. That's kind of where I think like, oh, just write it all in Rust. You can check all the code where that mentality kind of comes from. uh, And hence, we have the the difficulties that we have. Okay. Okay. This is definitely an incredibly ambitious project from DARPA. And that's a good thing. Memory unsafe programming languages like C and C++ represent huge amounts of security risk to the overall digital ecosystem and therefore necessitate proportional investments to improve resilience. A resolution will require a balanced portfolio approach as DARPA's efforts here are from the research portion of that portfolio and offer higher risk and higher reward. But DARPA has invested in the work like this before. DARPA's mission is to avoid technological surprises. Therefore, it funds high risk, high reward work and doesn't expect every project to produce a working solution, said Pierre Layson, co-founder and CEO of Immunent. I mean, that makes sense. That's a, that's a good way to do stuff. Uh, my employer, Immunent, is maintaining a C to Rust translation tool, which has been developed with the support from DARPA, he said. We've also migrated C code to Rust using this tool plus manual effort. 
Didn't so my question to like the community at large is like, didn't we already do this with Ada back in the day? Like, wasn't Ada the language the result of like government research and a C yeah. on safety? And we still don't use Ada today. So I am kind of curious, like, what happened there? Like, was it a cultural issue where we just like didn't enforce it? Was it a technical issue where we realized we couldn't do this? Like, what what went wrong with Ada? I'm too young to know the Ada story. Um, so maybe someone else knows. But I'm I, it is interesting that we've we've kind of I know been it's here. not good. It was not yeah. a good language to begin with. Okay. And I think uh, ADA is used within the government. Uh, there are portions of the government that uses ADA. ADA okay. But the problem is, is that no one outside of the government who was forced to use ADA used ADA. Okay. So maybe there's like not a not an outside culture for it the government can recruit from kind of thing. Whereas like Rust, people already love and – well, not love. People use Rust. You know what I mean? So they can pull people in from the outside. Yeah. Maybe that's it. Yeah, interesting. Compiler errors will continue to happen until love increases and morale. Yes, and morale. Yeah, that that's the Rust motto. Moreover, ultimately, while this is not likely to be short-term or easy answer to the challenges of memory safety or unsafety, I think it's reasonable to expect that this is an aim for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll end up among the stars type of project said one of the developers familiar with the tra with Tractor, who requested anonymity as the federal government employee. Even if DARPA falls short of their vision of totally auto uh, automatically rewrites, automatic rewrites, there are still huge opportunities for large advances that reduce cost and improve security. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, it, yeah. I'm I mean, still, I'm, it, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going to come out of it, but I think I agree, right? Like, if... As long as we do this and we we take notes and we write it down somewhere, then we'll we'll figure out if this is even possible. And I think that's that's a win overall. Even if we find out like, hey, can't do it, sorry. Like, okay, now we know. Now we know what else has to happen. Yeah, there's there's a weird underlying bet that always goes on in these, which is that they believe that LLMs are going to infinitely continue to improve, and right. just we don't know if that's true. Maybe mm -hmm. they only improve by five, ten percent every year for the next ten years, and that does not get us anywhere near where we need to be. Yeah, I and agree. so in ten years you're like, well, it still doesn't work. We just didn't improve. Mm -hmm. Dang, yeah, <laughs> sucks. All right, as many have noted, getting code to work is one thing. Having understandable and maintaining maintainable code is another. We we talked. Th this was our express worry. I I would personally not want to be thrust into an AI code base. Mm -hmm. Ugh. However, there is value in building knowledge. If you have a team rewriting a piece of software like we did NTP, you'll end up with a group of experts on. Let's see, of experts on, in this case, time synchronization, a group of people who understand how the software works and can maintain and improve it. Bingo. Eric yeah. Jonkers, a director of open source at Tweed Golf, a Dutch software consultancy specializing in Rust development. When you translate code, you get developers who know the tricks to polish translated code, but don't, to put it bluntly, know the, how the software works, Jonkers explains. Of course, you can plug that hole by investing time in understanding the translated code, the architecture, or underlying specifications. But the question then becomes whether that is still more, uh, still a more productive expertise and efficient cost approach. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the worry too for me is like this is coming off like people are taking it as a, a zero debt approach. Like, oh, we write the script and then we run the script and then we have the Rust code. And it's like, nah, dude, like you still need a team of people that know Rust, that can test the code. You still need a team of people that like, like they're saying in the NTP case that know how NTP works and can write meaningful tests on the code base. Like, I think it does get rid of a lot of the lift of translating the code. That is a significant task, but if can be automated, would be great. Um, but there is still a lot of debt on the back end of that after you finish that pro that task. Well, so I'll give you a little 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 anecdote. One time I was working on an open piece, uh, open source piece of software, and I looked at a specific kind of part of it that was doing the request uh, deduping and caching and all that, and I said, "Man, this is just some horseshit code." So I was like, I can do this better. So I started writing, and I wrote it. And then I started understanding some of the parts of the problem, and I started making some concessions here and there. And lo and behold, like two weeks later, I wrote identical code. People are fundamentally bad at understanding the program or the, the point of the program until you program the program. So translating right. it from C to Rust without understanding, you have a very difficult problem ahead of you, which is, is this even good? How do I even know this approach is good? Because I don't even know the reasons why they like why the LLM has made these trade offs in right. these positions because I don't right. even understand the thing underneath it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with that. It, it is, uh, yeah, 
No, you're right. That's funny that you wrote it twice. You you just wrote it again. You're like, oh, I, I did. I literally it. wrote it almost like line for line twice. That's hilarious. and I could start seeing it happen like a week it week and a half into it. I was like, dang it, it really wasn't all that bad. Like mine had some slight API changes that I thought were more convenient, but mm-hmm. at the end, I was like, that was a waste of time. I should not have done that. That was stupid of me. Oh, yeah. Should have just dealt with it. Uh, this is not necessarily the way to simulate. Or yeah, stimulate talented individuals to become leading experts in a specific field. It seems more likely that developers would abandon the project and leave the project owner with code that runs and nobody dares touches. Not only that, but the way you would probably organize things in Rust probably differs than how you'd organize it in C. So, in terms of like, uh, you mean like like project structure or like the project code structure, code structure, where yeah. the uh, mutation and things happen. Mm-hmm. So it kind of seems like. The only real way is to try to rewrite it correctly in the idiomatic sense so that you both understand the project and the code you wrote. Well, it's, I wouldn't even touch on this either yet. Like, okay, so in C, we know that C is a very simple, very basic language with, like, not a lot of features, right? That's, like, intentional. You do all the things yourself. You make it as you go. Rust is a more featureful language, and I'm curious if... We could be like introducing logic bugs by, for example, taking a snippet of C code and then making it traitful in Rust. You know what I mean? And like we didn't, yeah. we didn't. The people that are doing the code translation don't know how NTP works. We've made these NTP traits in Rust. Not really sure why they're there. And now we have this code base. Like I said, it works. But if you dare touch it, like it explodes. We don't know how it actually functions, which is I think more dangerous than just having the C code. Yes. Yes, because if there is a vulnerability that is discovered just in pure operation of how it's going, you could imagine that then you could not fix it in your translated version because nobody actually knows how the thing works. Right, right. And You're if like, they touch ah, it the wrong crap. way, it just falls over. Like, oh, okay. Well. we'll fix that in six months. Be right back. Uh, all right. Yet despite the uh, risk, Jonker said Tweed Golf is interested in this approach. Undoubt- let's see, undoubtedly. Undoubt- there are pieces of software components and other types of software for which it does make sense to take a translation approach, he said. For instance, uh, Muninent uh, created C to Rust, a C to Rust translator. It was using it for the AO Media Video 1. That's the AV1. Immuninent has immunin, immunant, immunant, uh, has done C to Rust work uh, similarly to what Tweed Golf has done, Larson said. We are planning to use C to Rust for the BZIP2 port. We'll, uh, we will use that experience to better judge its feasibility and compare it to the form uh, from scratch approach we use for pseudo and NTP, Jonker said. You know, something that's also missing in here is everything that they're talking about are very well-defined in and out problems. Mm-hmm. Like BZIP is obviously a very well-defined problem. Right. I assume these other ones, I, I, I've never, I never did anything with NTP, so I don't NTP know. NTP is very basic. Like it's okay. literally just like read the time from a known authoritative source form it into a float, send it. Like, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah. And same, same with BZIP, same with AV1. Like, they're, they're well-known binary data formats. I think it gets weird with things that are, like, either more robust in feature or more stateful, right? Because those are all fairly stateless, too. Like, you're, yeah. you're just taking and packing and shipping a binary format, which is much more complicated, much less complicated than, like, the Windows kernel. You know what I mean? Or, like, the, <laughs> the Linux kernel. So Yeah. I expect we will know more in a couple months, he added. Our first experiment says that it is not a silver bullet currently, but it can be useful. It works reasonably well for certain pieces of code, but not for all. In any case, it requires additional manual work to get a production-ready state. Don't wait to act. The time to start is now as DARPA takes an effective lead in this effort or an active lead. I just misread things constantly uh, to, in this effort to promote memory safety. I have no doubt that DARPA can improve the situation and that the code produced will be of high, higher quality in more cases and LLM-powered solutions will contribute to that, Jonker said. It will take a while before they get it, uh, before they get there, I'd say. I mean, I, I, still... I like the patient approach, right? I think I'm fine with that. Like, I, I agree that LLMs can have a positive impact in this. There is a, a, um, a research objective that makes sense here. And I think as long as we're slow with it, people are patient with it, I think it's a good thing for the community. Even if we find out that, we, that it's not possible, like, okay, cool, now we know. Now we've got to do something else. If anything... The fact that this is going to take probably a decade before it really resolves itself should be a very good wind in the sails Mm -hmm. uh, for us as developers because I know a lot of people feel like LLMs are just right around the corner from screwing you. Right. But maybe you just don't even have to be all that worried because if this is going to take forever, then maybe you don't have to be as worried about everything being taken from you as well. 
if you have the smartest people with the most millions of dollars, assuming the smartest and assuming the millions of dollars, uh, can't can't do it immediately, you probably got a lot of time. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, however, companies that have large existing exposure to risk, security risk from C or C++ should not treat this as an excuse to wait for years to act. Companies need to be taking proactive steps today to both mitigate that risk and start replacing C and C++ entirely. With Zig, uh, I believe that it is an extremely hard problem, but also one that is worth pursuing, Larson said. Well, Hell thank yeah. you, Daryl. Very cool. Thanks, Daryl. Appreciate it. Thanks, Daryl. Solid article. Um yeah, I mean, I, again, I think I've said what I wanted to say. Like, it's it's a good idea. I hope it goes well. I'm skeptical of the AI angle, but I'm also just generally skeptical skeptical of AI writ large. So maybe as AI improves, the potential solutions improve too. But I, I'm very curious to hear where this goes. Yeah, I know. I think I, I, I have the pessimist problem like you do. Yeah, I'm still on the very pessimist style uh, side of things. And in fact, just yesterday I had Ginger Bill on here. He created out and we mentioned this earlier. Mm -hmm. And you know what he did just recently? He even has turned off his LSP and programs without any help at all. And he says that it has been improving his ability to ship code speedily and more correctly. So full disclosure, I don't use an LSP because I'm awesome. No, because I'm lazy as shit. I don't want to set it up. Um, but also, I think I just I think I kind of agree with that, where I don't want to get dependent on it, and I want to internalize the features of the language. And I'm nervous that I'm using it as a crutch. Not that it is a crutch, right? But I think I just I get I get naturally very comfortable with things that are quick for me, and I don't want to get addicted to that. So I think LSPs are maybe bad over time, personally. Yeah, I, I, I'm so curious by that because I, I, I tried – because there's things that I really love about an LSP, like find references I think is something that's amazing, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, it's it, that to me just seems like an overall win no matter what because that's a navigation problem. I feel like navigation is – is sure. such a win if you can you mean improve like the find speed. uses of this function type functionality yes. yeah, yeah yeah i use those all the time no i agree but i think it's more like the lsps that are like either immediately showing you syntax errors or immediately showing you the, the api prototype for a function right i think those are a little handholdy and i want to more internalize my knowledge which i think an lsp might hurt over time but yeah like finding the definition of a function i think is, is a good use because that's just like you're saying navigation yeah. issue so I found I found that to be a very I mean me personally I found that to be a I I have a hard time believing it, but I also turned off Copilot about four months ago by accident, mm -hmm. and I noticed a dramatic improvement in both speed of the code I was producing and the quality of the code I'm producing. You and said so, you had like a, a Copilot pause, right? Where you're like kind of waiting yes. for it to do a thing. Yeah, yeah I would yeah. start typing. And I'd stop at every single f for statement or if statement or all right. these things, right. and I realized I kind of like what kept turning off my brain. You know, not realizing I was turning it off, and I, I used Copilot for a year, and I thought I was—I thought it was faster using Copilot. I genuinely thought I was faster. Did you so find it wasn't to be faster after the fact. Like you turned it off, and now you think you're. you're yeah, faster. now I think I'm, I'm much faster than I was. Wow. Okay. And so okay. I, so I am, I am probably going to give this no LSP try. By the way, at DefCon when we were programming, I didn't mm -hmm. have an LSP. Well, that's because your your entire network stack was effed up, right? Well, that's actually that's, that runs locally. Never yeah, mind. that, yeah, that but, should be. I don't know what happened. I, somehow I broke my. I somehow just turned off my LSPs globally, and I haven't figured out what I did, and I just haven't turned them really back on. I'm just giving it a shot. Okay, hold help. On. Hold you're, on. Oh, hold on. you're doing you something. Go. Perfect. All right, let me let me. Hey, let me get you big. Hold on. Let me get you big, buddy. I got I got you, bud. Hell yeah! Look at this. Look at this peak performance. These two gentlemen out here, Crash Max and relaxing all cool and all shooting some b-ball outside of the school. So if you're not did, familiar, did you practice that or did you did, did that just come off all? It came, it came into my head. I heard I heard Crash Maxing and I'm like the Fresh Prince. We have to be the Fresh Prince. So yeah, this is uh, Prime and I, Crash Max and all cool. Uh, you know, solving some some problems in the Crash Maxing competition at uh, at Def Con. We didn't do super hot. Uh, you can see here by the scoreboard that has us. Down here towards last at negative two. But I think overall we had negative we had 13 fun. really took the big L. We solved yeah. some problems later on. We rose later on. Yeah, we but did. nonetheless, did. I, I do think something that's very fair to state, okay, is that there was hundreds of teams that participated and we did get fourth in yeah. the tryouts. Oh, and the qualifiers so even, we kicked ass. Yeah, yeah, qualifiers, we absolutely kicked ass. We could also both program though. 
Yes, that does help. Uh, I was kind of pissed that network latency was part of the problem too. Like we did it in the hotel room and like, it was like, oh, a 13 second solve. And then you move somewhere else and it was like four seconds. Like, oh, okay. So literally just faster internet wins for some of these. Like, ugh. Yes, we literally won because of faster internet. Yeah. Skill we issue. would have been, we, we may have been like 11th if we didn't turn on faster internet hack. Yeah. And then I tried to optimize it and then I like broke it. And then I didn't realize when you resubmit it, like it just nukes your old score. So we like yeah. didn't qualify for a second. Yeah. 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 I was awesome. sitting in the room with the person that runs it and he's just like, uh, you don't have a submission. And I'm like, yeah, I did. It was like, it was like seven seconds. He's like, no, I was in don't. the corner. Like, like, Oh no, <laughs> I ruined our competition. <laughs> like, yeah. no, you were like, what? I didn't do anything. And I was like, dude, you resubmit it. And you're like, I don't, I don't know about that. I might have or something. I don't even know. I was getting real nervous that I fucked us, and uh, I, I didn't want to admit it. But so. don't worry, I jumped in right away, hit go. It took five seconds. Called it, called it a day. High five. We did it in the hotel room. Triple L. That is, that is a good quote, actually. Good point. Without context, that uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, baby. You know what I mean? Why they call me Caboose? All hell right, yeah. Um, hell yeah, brother. Um, all right, leave it at that. The name. What's your name? Low level learning, baby. We out here learning low level. Or something. Yeah. 